We recommend listening to the CW Pod with a glass of Steeple Ridge bourbon. Mm. Grown, distilled, well-rested, and bottled in Erling, Iowa. Now, from the Channel Seed Studios, this is the CW Pod, fueled by Steeple Ridge. Hello, CW Pod here on Iowa Everywhere. Recorded this on Tuesday, July the 16th with my buddy Tim Murray from VSIN. That is the Vegas sports betting uh, channel that you can watch. Uh, if you have YouTube TV, you can get the add on. Uh, you can get an online subscription to it. I, I'm a religious viewer. I, I have it on, especially during the season. It's on all day, every day in my office. Uh, and Tim is a, a great dude. Hassel and I have met him on our trips to Vegas, and we've become really good buddies with him. And he's a brilliant college football guy. So I, I hung out with him last weekend or last week when I was at Big 12 Media Days, asked him to come on the pod to talk about some lines, and he did that. So if you're into futures betting for college football or just a college football fan we we get into a lot of these teams at pretty big 12 heavy today but we do do iowa nebraska we 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 touch on some big 10 stuff he's going to come back on to do big 10 after big 10 media day so i wanted to update you on that we are presented as always by our friends at steeple ridge bourbon mm, mm, mm. i have the black label in my hand this is my favorite of the steeple ridge bourbon that's readily available if you can find that green label the sweet mash rye i would highly encourage that that is a treat as well but i love me this black label from steeple ridge over there in erling iowa it is my buddy pat hoffman thank you to him for sponsoring what we do here on cw pod on iowa everywhere we are in the channel seed studios of course and we are excited to talk college football Last week was a uh, a not so fun show. It was an inspiring show with my neighbor and um, my my neighbor Joni Hutchison. We raised a ton of money for Living Ava's Way. Thank you to all of you who donated to that cause. It's incredible generosity across the board. So thank you very much. Uh, but today we are all in on college football, and we are going to look at some futures bets and some teams that Tim and I are high low on. All that good stuff. Going to go for about forty minutes or so. If you're a college football geek, that's all we do here for the next 40 minutes. Again, his name is Tim Murray. Uh, he is a college football expert from VSIN, and we're going to do it now here on the CW Pod on Iowa Everywhere. All right, fired up. We are back from Vegas. We had the Big 12 Football Media Days last week, SEC going right now. Of course, we'll be doing Big 10 stuff coming up next week here on Iowa Everywhere. But I wanted to bring on a buddy of mine. Uh, me and Hassel have met this guy when we've been out in Vegas, and we really like him. He's had us on his podcast before, and we wanted to uh, bring him on here on Iowa Everywhere to talk some college football. Tim Murray from the VSIN College Football Betting Podcast. Now, he's also – Tim, you're kind of like the jack of all trades on VSIN right now. I never know like exactly when you're going to be on because you're, you're, you're pulling all sorts of duties. Uh, how can people watch you right now these days? Yeah, normally I'm on uh, 5 to 8 Central Time, so 5 to 8 p.m. Central Time, VEASAN Prime Time. Um, if folks out in your neck of the woods has mar have Marquee Network, I think some Cub fans might have that. Um, okay. I think our first hour's on there, but YouTube TV. But yes, uh, as we speak this week, I might be, I'm, I'm a little bleary-eyed. I'm doing mornings this week, but uh, no, normally uh, normally in the evening times out there on VEASAN. Well, you do a great job. Uh, it's been fun. I I subscribe through YouTube TV, and it's yeah. I it's funny. I I'm into like um, this is probably foreign to you, but I'm into like dirt track racing. You ever been to Ooh. a dirt track race? I have not. not. So I like that, and I want, and I'm a big gambler, right? So between Vsin and these like streaming services, like I don't even watch normal TV hardly at all. I have you guys on in my office about all day to be honest with you and then you also have your sports betting podcast too but you're give us some background here on you for people who don't know who you are because you're a diehard college football guy you blend in really well with me and hassle like that's your passion where did that come from yeah it's actually kind of funny because uh i'm sure a lot of people are are noticing uh it's hard to not notice the college football video game craze oh yeah on social media right now and with this becoming as you know, popular as it has been, um, I kind of give the football game a lot of credit. So I grew up in DC 
And for those who are not aware, uh, DC is a pro sports town. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a town that uh, only cares, to be honest, about you know the four pro teams. We didn't have a baseball team till until '05, but every once in a while, when Maryland hoops or Georgetown hoops would do its thing, you'd be like, "Oh, that's cool." But it's a pro sports town. But you know, I grew up in a household that was not from the DC area. Uh, my folks are from uh, Long Island in, in New York, and my dad went to Notre Dame. So my dad you know, would watch Notre Dame games on Saturday and I would watch them with them. And that kind of led to that craze uh, mm. that I have over my shoulder for anyone who could see that's a, a panoramic of Notre Dame stadium. And, and then I just took it to the next level. I've always loved sports. Uh, and I knew this is what I wanted to do. And, and then playing the video game, I think just took it to another level where you, know, you learn the teams, you learn a little bit more about them and then you just kind of dive into it. So yeah, I, I've been fortunate to be able to talk about it especially more so since I got the visa and, and I've kind of become one of the the college football folks here uh, at the network. So look, I, I love it. I mean, I love college hoops too, but I mean, you know, college football is, is incredible. And I try to, I try to get to an, as many games as I can uh, past couple of years. I've done some sideline work for bowl games, which has been pretty sweet too. Uh, so, you know, the more, the more I could do the better man. And uh, it, it's been a lot of fun, especially kind of, carving out the niche from a from a gambling standpoint too over the past handful of years well the gambling thing has made college football this this sounds weird coming from a guy in the state of iowa after everything that happened last year but it's so much more enjoyable I, so i did sports talk radio in des moines for almost 10 years and i've been doing the cyclone thing forever but like with with, with the nfl there's always this feeling where the worst team on a on a good sunday can beat the best team because the the rosters are even and like there's this like this whole there, there's not like this crazy difference in styles right like with college football when you have to talk about it all day every day for 365 days which is basically what we did the gambling aspect makes it so much more interesting you know when a I, i'm looking ahead today it's like clemson georgia it's probably going to be like a 13 and a half 14 yeah. point line whatever that is like it's so much more interesting to talk about and look at these games with the gambling aspect. And, and that's it, it, the sports betting, when it, when it became legal in Iowa, it made the sport so much more enjoyable to me from that aspect, as far as storylines go. But now, and this is where I really want your expertise because I have a hard time with this with, you know, I read every, we're all reading Phil Steele and doing all that stuff. And a lot of these like metrics and things that we would go off of 10 years ago, I don't know how relevant they are now with the portal, yeah. right? When, when these teams are completely flipping rosters, it's like, I don't, eh. you know, I'm reading Phil's deal and and we both like him. I'm not, eh, he, and he is, a, he is adjusting, but it's like, I don't really care what the team did three years ago now. Right. Yeah. Like development seems like such an archaic thing to me in college football. Now, not with Iowa and Iowa state, they're a little bit different, but how much, how much more difficult do you think handicapping is this sport compared to maybe even five years ago before we saw these rosters flip the way that they are? It's it's a really great question, and I think it is it's fascinating. And I, I'll give you two examples heading into this year where you look at Ole Miss. Ole Miss, you know, for for those unaware, is a team that was the number one ranked portal team according to two four seven Sports. They went out and they added a ton, right? They added the best edge rusher uh, in Walter Nolan in the country. Uh, pulling him from Texas A&M. They pulled another edge rusher. Well, Nolan's more of an interior guy. They pulled an edge rusher from Florida. Uh, they they brought in two running backs. They let Quinshawn Judkins go. Like They are really working their roster as if it is kind of a professional roster down there at Ole Miss. Obviously, Colorado, as Iowa F State fans, will get to know a little bit more with them joining the Big 12 is very similar. But you know, I'm starting to get to the point, Chris, where I'm wondering – these teams that go all in on the portal is that do we overrate them a little bit like mm -hmm. Ole Miss is going to be preseason top 10 and you know they won 11 games last year but are they a team that's good enough to win a national championship I mean you look at Georgia which is obviously the standard right now you know the pieces that they were able to grab like they grabbed a, a wide receiver from Miami, I believe it was Jacob Young. I have to double check that, but uh, Jacob Young, yeah, they, they, had, right. they grabbed ETN from Florida and, and they're kind of uh, icing on the cake, so to speak, to add to the depth of, of what they've built. 
And then you get a team like Clemson who just doesn't go to the portal and refuses to do so. And, you know, I'm wondering maybe is Clemson a little undervalued this Mm -hmm. year because, you know, Dabo just, just refuses to go into the portal. So, you know, the team that won the national championship, my uh, Michigan, excuse me, last year, um, it was a team that didn't really necessarily go that deep into the portal. I, I think we're getting to the point, Chris, where I think we're starting to understand what the portal should be used for, which is kind of building those depth. You still have to recruit at a high level. You still have to build the culture and then kind of cherry pick pieces that, all right, we missed on a linebacker in this cycle. Let's pick him up in the portal. You know, obviously quarterbacks are are moving around like gangbusters, but you know, I look at Oregon, a team that I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one, but like, I'm really high on Oregon. They're preseason top four teams. So I'm not going out on a limb there, but like, yeah. I think Dylan Gabriel going there from Oklahoma, I think he just fits there really well with that offense, with those pieces, with that offensive line. And then you flip, you know, flip it to like a uh, Will Howard, like what is Will Howard going to look like? I mean, you guys know this as folks who fo- call the big, follow the big 12, like Will Howard, Kansas State said you get you're good to go. You can yeah, leave. He and, wasn't going to win that job, right? Like Avery Johnson's the better quarterback right now for for what Kansas State is looking for and is getting preseason Heisman hype, and he's now going to be the starter. Will Howard of Ohio State, but they don't really need uh, a superstar back there with all the weapons that they have. So I think it is challenging. I think people are going to take different stances, um, you know, from a handicapping standpoint. But I think this year is going to be really interesting from, you know, let's look at how Ole Miss does. Let's look at how Clemson does. And then let's look at how other teams do that just kind of plug holes. Like, you know, a team that I follow very closely, Notre Dame, right? They they brought in a new quarterback. They tried to plug some depth with, with different pieces uh, from the transfer portal. So it's an inexact science, but I think we've kind of learned at least so far that trying to build like an all-star team via the portal isn't going to win you a championship. No, we've seen chemistry problems. We've seen stuff like that that really matter. And and that's where our team's coming to play Iowa and Iowa State. They are not crazy in the portal either. Like these yeah. are actual, like still, still to this point, developmental programs. And I think that both of them too, I, I – I think it'll benefit both of them this year. I mean, Iowa State brings back 19 starters. Iowa brings back the bulk of its defense that was one of the best in college football a year ago. Uh, and you'd think that they're, they they can't get worse on offense, you would think, with with the changes that they've made. Uh, just an overview, Tim, and I, and I want to get into uh, – actually, you know what? Before we get to Iowa and Iowa State, I wanted yeah. to follow up on the Oregon comment. Yeah. I, I think, in, in my opinion, it matters less to like an Oregon and the USC – you know, who recruited a certain level. I'm really curious about all of these Pac-12 schools that are going to a different league. Mm-hmm. Realignment has not been kind to teams immediately following it. In in general, Missouri had a pretty good year, but they were at the height of the Gary Pinkle area, era, and the SEC East was just garbage back then. You know, and they, they went over and won the SEC. In general, it's hard to switch leagues. How are you taking that into account for not just Oregon uh, who you're high on and everybody is and I think Dan Lanning is phenomenal but just all these teams do you do you consider that do you not knock them down a notch when you're handicapping all these Pac-12 teams I think this year is really going to test a lot of it right because you look at uh, just betting odds and the newbie in the big 12 is the favorite Utah uh, even though it's not overwhelming and I think you know we'll get into it I, I truly believe the big 12 is the most fascinating conference in college football this year with the possibility of parity and you know with the auto uh you know the auto buy uh that's going to be on the line i think the big 12 is going to be awesome like mm-hmm. it's going to be frustrating i'm sure because there's going to be losses out there that you know teams shouldn't take but i think from a standpoint of uh, betting week to week uh you know from entertainment just non-betting i, I think the you know, the big 12 is going to be really fascinating, but yeah, I think this year it's going to be interesting because you're not in recent years, not all the time. You mentioned Missouri, you know, going into the sec, but in recent years, I felt like you've had a lot of the jump ups, right? Like Cincinnati and UCF and and those people jumping up. Like the PAC 12 was a power five conference that just got dissolved. So you're, you're getting these schools going 
laterally to an extent, right? So, yeah. you and know, would, I think many of them say a step down. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would Pac-12 think that there than might than be an argument for the Utah fan base to yeah. believe that they are taking a step down, whether you believe that or not. That's a yeah. discussion for another day. But, you know, you got Oregon, you know, going into the Big Ten. And this is a team that was on the doorstep of making the playoff a year ago if they don't, you know, lose uh, to to Washington twice. And and this is an Oregon team that, remember, uh, went to Columbus a couple of years ago and won, you know, uh, and beat this Ohio State program. So um, I don't think Oregon, the way that they've built that roster, Dan Lanning being from the SEC and, you know, them having the NIL backing that they do with Phil Knight, I don't think they're going to have necessarily a step uh, down, but I do think you look at a, a program like Washington or a program like UCLA, I, I think they could struggle. Like UCLA is an under bet that I have in pocket under five and a half wins, you know, losing their head coach as late as they did. Chip Kelly going to mm-hmm. Ohio State, bringing in a first time head coach and Deshaun Foster, I think is going to be a really challenge. And then, you know, so much of this, Chris, too, and, and we'll get into it, is like, just kind of luck of the draw. These conferences are so enormous now. So you look at like Missouri, for example, I think Phil Steele had their strength of schedule, like 60th or something like that. Um, And then you look at Florida and they might have the hardest schedule in the history of college football. Like it's just so interesting to look at within conferences. It didn't used to be this way. Hey, maybe, maybe in the big 12, you'd play one extra game that was a little bit more challenging, but now, I mean, you're looking at, um, you know, I was trying to think, of, uh, we'll talk about Iowa. I mean, Iowa plays Ohio State, but they don't play Oregon. They don't play Michigan. They don't play USC. Uh, you know, they they have a very, uh, they don't play Penn State. I mean, yeah. Iowa avoids four of the top five teams outside of themselves, right? So it's, it's really fascinating to look at that all. And then, you know, from the Big 12 standpoint, a team that everybody wants to talk about, Colorado. Colorado doesn't get to play Arizona State, doesn't get to play, uh, BYU and doesn't get to play Houston, the perceived three worst teams in the conference. So it's it's really, I think it does take a, you know, from a scheduling standpoint, you know, where do you stand in a team that I'm sure, I know we wanted to talk about too, Nebraska. I mean, Nebraska, their first seven games, I think they will be a favorite in every single one of their, you know, opening seven games this year. Yeah, the the fans are going to hate me, but I'm high on Nebraska. If, They're if good, no man. One, are you with me there? I just, rule... I, I, I've covered him at, in the Big 12. I don't know what his ceiling is there, but Rule feels to me like a guy in the way they've recruited. And I just, I'm from over there and I know the support that they have. I mean, it's, it's incredible the amount of money that they have, all this stuff to get their quarterback. You know, the, to me, like he's a guy who will have them to a floor, like where they're eight and four on a bad year but I don't necessarily know if Nebraska is ever going to be winning 11 games consistently, like maybe their fans want, but I I think rule gets them to that point. Maybe as soon as this year, I'm a big, and I know Phil Steele points it out in his magazine. I'm a big, you know, regression to the means type of person, right? If something's Mm -hmm. way too out of whack in a positive way, it's going to come back down. And then on the flip side, so like Nebraska at minus 17 from a turnover margin, like, is it going to be, it's going to get back to normal, right? It's just, It's not, you know, it's kind of like playing roulette where you see three straight black and the odds aren't going to tell you it's going to go red, but your mind says, yeah, it's probably going to go red. It's it's 50-50 every single time, but it just kind of, it is that a little bit of regression. Maybe that's a bad example, but I I don't think Nebraska is going to have the turnover, you know, uh, disastrous type season that they had a year ago. I mean, the defense is the real deal. and, And you mentioned Matt Rule. Let's just look at, his previous two stops and what he did from year one to year two. Temple, two and 10. They went six and six the next year. Baylor, one and 11. And they went seven and six the next year. I'm not saying Nebraska is going to go 10 and two, but this is a team that should make a jump up. Uh, I think they'll beat Colorado in that big game week two. I think that's going to be a really fun one to watch. You know, they, they completely melted against Colorado a year ago uh, in Boulder. So, you know, I don't know what Jaden Rashada is going to be, um, uh, but you know, I, I think that ultimately, did I say Jaden Rashada? You did. Uh, Dylan Riola, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Riola uh, is going to be ultimately, but 
can, can he be any worse than what they had a year ago? You know, so uh, I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm a huge Matt Rule guy. I mean, I, I like to look at coaches from the standpoint of what happens after they leave. I'm like, and yeah. Temple, now they've, they've fallen on some hard times, but my goodness gracious, like Temple is the worst. It, I think they're the worst program in college football this year. The um the Big Ten West thing is it's been a talking point here in the state of Iowa for a long time, and and you nailed it with with the Hawks. I mean they they still have a Big Ten West schedule. Yeah, right. And then you so we played your clip from from your show that you sent me about Phil Steele on Iowa saying it's his best bet. Pound the Hawks in the over, and uh, I mean it, he makes a good point, but yeah. I, I could also make the point too the. Re- Return to the mean. Iowa's been on this defensive turnover streak for a really long time, and I'm <laughs> I'm guilty of always believing that that has to turn around. But maybe they're just really good at coaching it too. Um, and, but then the, it's like I'm I I know how inept that offense has been. I've had to unfortunately watch it every freaking game for <laughs> ten years, whatever. They can't be that bad. So even if the defense comes back a little bit, Tim, like the offense has to get a little bit better. Are you all in on the Hawks like Phil Steele is? I mean, he pushed me over the top. I did bet them over seven and a half. And right now, um, you know, they're going to be an underdog. As Phil mentioned, uh, Brad Powers, another uh, college football handicapper that I I really respect. He tweeted this out the other day. I was going to be an underdog in one game. I mean, that that's the the fact now. You could flip that and also tell, say that they've got six toss-up games, in mm-hmm. my opinion, right? I think uh, Iowa State's a toss-up game. Minnesota on the road's a toss-up game. Wisconsin at UCLA, at Maryland, and then Nebraska. All are toss-up games. So what do you do in those toss-up games? But, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, and I asked you, I was trying to pick your brain a little bit about the Tim Lester hire. You know, what was the reaction from from Iowa fans of hiring Tim Lester uh, after getting rid of Brian Ferentz. But yeah, I mean, can the offense be any worse? I do think the fact that they went out and got Brendan Sullivan in the portal raised an eyebrow a little bit, but I think it was also smart to say, mm-hmm. all right, if Cade McNamara isn't full go, or if he's still dealing with some stuff, we've got a a Big Ten quarterback backing him up and Brendan Sullivan, so they don't have to go to, you know, no offense to Deacon Hill, but don't have to go to Deacon Hill. And, you know, a guy who's what playing at Utah tech now in the FCS yeah. ranks. So yeah. um, the defense is going to be awesome. And, you know, we know that, um, you know, I, I thought a point that was made, uh, I was listening to um, a different podcast and uh, you know, I don't know what, what the loss of Tory Taylor is going to be, you know, I mean, he, he flipped the field. It felt like every single time he came out there and, you know, was arguably the most valuable offensive player that Iowa had just a year ago, but you know, you look at the schedule, the fact that outside of a road trip to Ohio State, which, you know, by the way, I'll just point this out. I'm a big proponent of letdowns and look aheads. Like, I don't think Ohio State is going to overlook Iowa, but it is worth noting that Iowa will be coming off a bye when they go to Columbus and Ohio State will be headed to Eugene the following weekend. Mm, so it note. is a scheduling spot that is slightly advantageous for the Hawkeyes heading to Columbus there in the only game, there'll be a, a real underdog uh, on the season. But yeah, I mean, I bet them, I, I bet them over seven and a half. Uh, they do have to play five big 10 road games, which, you know, you, you didn't win that coin toss. But I think if you asked any Iowa fan, hell, if I think you asked Kirk Ferentz, Hey, would you rather have uh, more home games in Penn state or Oregon, or would you rather have five road games and no Penn state, Oregon or Michigan on your schedule? Mm-hmm. I think they would take the latter. No doubt. Uh, Tim is the host of the v College Football Betting Podcast. Go and subscribe to that and put it on your feeds. It's a um, I, I lock into it two times a week during college football season. Never miss an episode. The um, Iowa State conversation, um, I you know, that's my favorite part of these media days is just BSing with other media guys and just yeah. picking their brains. Um, and we, we did that at, at Circa last week. And everybody it seems high on Iowa and Iowa State this year. I, I didn't talk to a single person that is down on those schools. And Iowa State, you know, I have one national guy say to me, he's like, I was flying here and I pulled up and I didn't realize they had 19 starters back. And and they do, but they kind of came out of nowhere last year because there's this gambling thing. But, I, you know, 
they're at seven and a half. I think um, you, I don't even know. I haven't, I haven't done too much look at these, at these numbers yet, but man, like this is another team. It's a very similar conversation to Iowa. Just a lot of these toss up games for the Cyclones this year. They're definitely underdogs when they go to Utah. They're probably going to be a slight dog when they go to Iowa. Feels like Kansas State, depending on how that thing is set up, is probably going to be a toss up. Kansas State would be a slight favorite right now. There are some games, and I want to pick my pick your brain about yeah. a couple of teams like UCF and Texas Tech that I think give Iowa State a hard time, but they get these teams at home. So where are you at on the Cyclones and that number heading into 2024? Yeah, I mean, and I'm sure you've talked about it, and and your depth of knowledge on Iowa State is better than mine, but, you know, talk about bringing back production. Uh, they're number one in the country uh, in returning production, according to Bill Conley, uh, from a year ago. Three, 90% of the offense, 81% of the defense returning. Uh, the win total is seven and a half, pretty much everywhere. Juice varies a little bit. Um, you know, say what you will about different sports books. I tend to high, uh, hold Circa at a pretty high regard from their clientele. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the juice at Circa is a little higher than, you know, the juice at a place like DraftKings. So it's minus 125 to the over at Circa minus 105 at DraftKings. So, you know, once again, use that information, what you will. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Rocco Beck, it's funny, um, <laughs> My uh, my co-host on Veasan Primetime, Jonathan Von Tobel, uh, went down a rabbit hole of, of looking at long shots to win the Heisman, and uh, he may or may not have put in a thousand to one bet on uh, on Rocco Beck. I don't know if that'll come home, but um, you know it, the schedule. I think is it's not great in the sense that they have to play Kansas, Kansas State, and Utah. They didn't get you know handed the uh, a great card in the sense that they have to play three of the perceived best teams in the conference. But, you know, for me, I think the Kansas game is really interesting. If I had to guess, Chris, and you could probably speak to this better than I could, but like Arrowhead Stadium is like an hour and a half away from Kansas's uh, campus. And I would imagine there could be more Iowa State fans there on November, you know, 8th than – than Kansas fans? I would put a lot of money that Iowa State doubles them up. Yeah. So is that a real road game? Not really, right? So Iowa State get, fans will treat that like a bowl game. Right. So I think that's a pretty cool, you know, that's a that's a that's a fortunate break. Yes, you have to play Kansas and they're coming off a bye. However, you get to play them at Arrowhead Stadium where you just said it, there's mm -hmm. going to be more Iowa State fans than Kansas fans there, uh, is almost a certainty. Yeah, going to West Virginia is always weird. I, I think you know, you've always learned that like that's a really big home field advantage. I do think what's an advantage and we'll get to UCF hosting UCF as opposed to going to the bounce house. The bounce house is tough, man. And like Oklahoma State learned that last year. I think Oklahoma State went down there late November and I want to say UCF put up like a 52 spot on them like they pummeled them. Um, so, you know, UCF's a team that uh, varying uh, opinions on them. I'm a little higher, I think, on UCF than maybe some others are. I think I am um, too. But you know, Chris, I, 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 like I said to start this conversation, man. Like, I legitimately think you can draw a line under like nine teams. Like, and if I told you Utah, Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Kansas, UCF, Iowa State, I'd even go as far as Arizona. I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I might be drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit too much on Arizona this year uh, because the market's kind of gone against them. But like, if you told me Arizona was in the big 12 championship, if you told me, uh, you know, Texas tech was in the big 12 championship, I could believe it, man. It's this conference is going to be so awesome to watch. So um, I know I went really long winded here. No, I don't have a, a strong opinion on Iowa state's win total. If I had to force a play, I'd probably play over with the production returning, but you know, Chris, I, I'm curious your thoughts on this as I pull the old uh, ask the host a question. But like, yeah. I remember 2019 as being like the year for Ohio's Iowa State, and that was a pretty disappointing year for for the Cyclones, right? Weren't they like preseason top 10? 21, yeah. The 21, okay, 21. Because it was the COVID year that they won the Fiesta Bowl, right? And beat Oregon, and yeah, they that's right. Brock Purdy, Brees Hall. All those guys coming back, they go seven and six. They ended up losing to Clemson in that bowl game. Um, 
this just feels different. Like yeah. they're not going to be in the top 25. I, I think that this is both of the coaches in this state. It's funny. Iowa fans would say the same thing. They tend to perform better mm -hmm. when the expectations are lower. Yeah. You know, and like last year, nobody saw Iowa State winning seven games. You had that whole gambling thing. Um, you're losing all that production, right? You lose Xavier Hutchinson, and then they, they just. I, you, I look more at you lose to Ohio, Chris. Like that game was like everyone. Like I felt you like you collectively oh. felt the entire country be like, "All right, we're that out. See done. you later." Yeah, and then they go seven and six. Well, and what they did though is. So I'll really, you've got to break up that Iowa State season last year into two halves, kind of like what Oklahoma State did. And that's why I'm curious about them. It's like after that Ohio game, they changed things up. Like they came back and they, they opened up the offense. Like it was a totally different offense in the second half of the season. And that's where you saw them really start to light things up. And Jaden Higgins becomes an NFL draft prospect. Abu Sama is now a, you know, probably one of the top four or five backs in the Big 12. And and that's where Rocco really picked it up. So, like, to me, that's what I go off of more with Iowa State because they were so young early last year. Quarterback hasn't played. Um, you know, running back hasn't played. And you had all those distractions in the offseason. It's that second half of the season. Go down and break down. I haven't done it. Break down Jaden Higgins' numbers in the last six games of last year compared to the first six i mean it's it's truly remarkable like the difference and it was so I, I give them credit because they didn't just sit still and be stubborn at the end of last year because we were like man after that ohio game what happens here you know like we we didn't know it's like are, are you even gonna win a big 12 game can you are you gonna go are you gonna want an 11 this year and then they they really flipped the switch and what was fascinating too tim so we talk about Oklahoma State. They come off that loss to South Alabama. So mm -hmm. Iowa State's recently lost to Ohio. Oklahoma State's recently lost to South Alabama. Iowa State wins that game by like three or seven, whatever it was. But both teams played really well. And it was a turning point for both of those teams for Oklahoma State to go off and rattle as many as they did. And Iowa State did. Uh, I, I think they're super similar because you talk about Iowa state's returning production. I believe Oklahoma state has the oldest team, the most experienced team in all of college football by most of these metrics. So I can't yeah, right there you know, with the Cyclones. Yeah. And Bill Conley, once again, I mean, uh, you know, he's the Phil, best. Phil Steele has it in his magazine too, but I, I just have Bill Conley's up right now. Um, Iowa state's number one in the country in returning production, Oklahoma state's number three, right? Okay. Iowa yeah. 10, by the way, for those wondering, and, you know, not all productions created equal. Sometimes teams, you know, the old saying is like, hey, yeah. we had a crappy defense. Do we want players coming back? Um, but you look at Oklahoma State, it, it is, and, and this is just my kind of feel from a, from a national perspective, it does feel like Oklahoma State is getting a lot more love than Iowa State is. You know, and I, and I know last week was, you know, the Gundy-Gordon you know, fiasco, so to speak, uh, with everything that went that way. But, you know, this is a team that, from a betting standpoint, opened at some shops as long as 12 to 1 to win the Big 12, and they're now down to, like, plus 750. They're pretty much the third shot pretty much everywhere you look. Uh, there were some shops that opened 7.5 on their win total. It's 8 painted across the board. So everywhere you look now for Oklahoma State, it is 8. Um, you know, I think we're going to learn really quickly what this Oklahoma state is made of. Um, you know, the South Dakota state game, I I'm not, you know, I know that's become like a kind of fun talking point because South Dakota state's an FCS power. And I believe they won the last two national championships, but I think they lost a bunch of talent from that squad a year ago, but you play Arkansas, which is, you know, a Bobby Petrino led offense with Taylor green, the Boise state transfer. And that's going to be kind of a tricky spot there for the pokes and, you know, history has told us that uh gundy doesn't really i don't want to say care but his uh his non-con is is kind of spotty he'll he'll lose some games as we talked about the south alabama game you know a year ago uh for them and then it, right out of the shoot it's utah and kansas state in in non -con in conference play right so you know we're going to learn pretty quickly but after that man it gets pretty open where you've got west virginia at home 
You've got a Friday night game uh, at BYU. You've got Baylor. You've got Arizona State. I mean, you've got three of the worst teams in the conference. Boom, boom, boom there in the end of October. And then you got at TCU, home to Texas Tech, and then finish off against Colorado. And who knows what Colorado will be from a depth standpoint, because that's a team where I think on the surface they got better. But I think Colorado by November 30th, in my opinion, might be kind of banged up and maybe falling apart at that spot. So, like, I think Oklahoma State grabbing them at the end of the season is is pretty, you know, uh, intriguing there. So, you know, this is a team that uh, I would not be surprised if they're playing again in the Big 12 championship. I mean, the fact that they were playing the Big 12 championship last year after losing to South Alabama and then Iowa State right after that was was pretty st- – pretty surprising. So I think a lot of it comes down to the quarterback, Alan Bowman. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Gundy outside of, you know, his moronic comments, I thought the comments that he made uh, about Ali Gordon and being hungry, I think that was interesting because last year, I mean, this is a dude that ran for 1700 yards and Chris, I think he ran for like a hundred yards in the first three games or something like that. Like he would just went on this crazy tear. Like he's now, a known commodity and and what does that do for him uh you know coming back moving forward when you know he's uh you know uh you know known as as the best running back in the country but the offensive line brings back like 200 plus starts so mm-hmm. this is a team that's 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 that should be pretty good and and people have bet them pretty pretty quickly this offseason the last point i would make on the big 12 is to reiterate what you said i mean about I think you could go seven, eight, maybe nine deep on teams where it wouldn't surprise me if they're yeah. playing for the Big 12 championship. And I, I I'm kind of developing a an opinion on these Texas schools. They're they're kind of like it's kind of like playing the stock market where if if you have a bad rally, right? If a stock has a bad rally, a lot of people will get emotional and sell them. <laughs> I would just be really careful with TCU and Texas Tech specifically, but I would probably throw Baylor into that mix too. Because, I mean, TCU, I mean, I know they weren't very good last year, but they had a ton of injuries, and they they were it was a rebuild. They were in the title game two years ago. They beat that Michigan team, right? Like, people forget about that. Like, the, this guy didn't forget how to coach. And I would I would make the same comment about Dave Aranda. And I, I think Texas Tech may be one of the most underrated teams in all of college football, getting picked eighth in that conference. With the way that their NIL is set up and the – the money I, again, I don't know. I don't have like a strong feeling any of those three teams are going to light the world on fire, but I, I've just to people out there who are just judging them off of last year, I'd be real careful because there's so much talent down there. I could see any of those three teams bouncing up and having a huge year. I want to start with Texas Tech real quick because I, I agree with you, and I think Joey McGuire is, is a really good coach and more importantly he's a really connected coach and you're seeing Mm -hmm. it from a recruiting standpoint um i believe his yeah micah hudson is that yeah that's the stud that they got like a five-star wide receiver like texas tech is getting five stars like oh (laughs) you know you're getting a five-star to come to lubbock like that's that's saying something so uh that's gonna be really interesting to see how it plays out and you got to remember this too about texas tech right where you know, they started one and three last year and, uh, you know, spoken from someone who had uh, Texas Tech uh, plus six against Oregon, which was one of the worst beats of the entire year. Um, you know, they lost that game. They lost a crazy game to open the season in double overtime to Wyoming. Um, this is a team that actually played some pretty good football down the stretch. Um, you know, they got blown out by Texas to close out the season, but uh, I actually was on the sidelines of their bowl game and they just pummeled Cal like they just were the more physical team and Taj Brooks you know you talk about NIL he was a guy that I just kind of assumed like all right this guy's gone right and Mm -hmm. no he's coming back they went out and they got they are loaded down there man and they got uh they got the kid from I think he was Washington State Josh Kelly Mm -hmm. uh, pretty talented wide receiver like Texas Tech's gonna be interesting man and that one on Iowa State schedule it's like most people will circle that oh they'll get that game makes me really nervous. At Lubbock in early November, that's a really that's a tricky spot, man. Yeah, now, Iowa true. State, I believe they're coming off a bye, so that's good. But yeah, I mean, and then you know Baylor. I don't know what to expect from Baylor this year because I mean it's just crazy that this was a team that 
you know, won this conference, what, three years ago. And now Dave Aranda's on the hot seat. He fires his defensive coordinator. He's going to be calling the defense. Correction uh, real quick, Tim. That game is in Ames. I just wanted to make sure we we clarified that. I oh, I'm sorry. I missed. Yep. My, my yep. mistake. Sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you there. Back to. Yeah, Baylor. no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so, I mean, Iowa State at home. Uh, yeah, that makes it's a lot better. a terrifying game. My point still stands. Like Texas Tech could come in and win that. And then Baylor, I don't know what to expect from Baylor because you play Utah week two, and then then you have a non-conference game against Air Force. And it's like, this team, are they in free fall at week three going to Colorado? Or are they, you know, 3-0 and and Jake Spavadol has got this offense rolling as he comes back from, you know, he had a year at Cal, uh, didn't work out at Texas State as a head coach, but, you know, he was the architect of some pretty – creative stuff at West Virginia. And now you bring in Daquan Finn from Toledo, a really athletic quarterback. So yeah, Baylor's one of those teams where I don't know what to do with yeah. uh, a ton of production coming back. Uh, but they were kind of a disaster last year. And, you know, I, I think they're kind of a boomer bust type of team where I could see them if they get off to a hot start, Chris, maybe being a, you know, kind of a thorn in some people's sides. They get to host Oklahoma state in the middle of October they go to Ames in early October. Um, but I think Baylor is one of those teams I would stay away from from a win total perspective. Their win total is at five um, just because like, I could see them completely collapsing or uh, Dave Aranda gets into his bag like he was at you know LSU as an, a defensive coordinator. And they're you know salty on defense and they've got this creative offense rolling. And that's a team, too, that could have a vacancy at head coach midseason. Exactly. Yeah. If they get into that spot and let, I mean, they got a lot of money there where they could lure somebody. Uh, Tim, this is great. Uh, I'll let you go. I, I'd love to bring you back before the season and maybe we can do heavier on the Big Ten. And and I, I'm going to keep developing some thoughts here on the Big 12 too. And if you ever need me or Chris for your show, we we're, we really appreciate your friendship. It's hopefully we can get back out to Vegas soon and see you. I did get in uh, circa millions when I was out there. So I'll Are be we doing Survivor or just millions. I'm just doing millions. Smart. I uh, yeah, I, I like the quarterly thing. Yeah, you know, it's like I did really. It was actually very eye opening last year. I I did really well, like better than I thought I could probably do in a contest like that. And I still wasn't sniffing it. You know, it, it was it, very it, humbling. It's crazy. Um, you know, with with the amount of people and the amount of money that uh, Derek Stevens guarantees six million for the millions and then ten million for Survivor. It's pretty, yeah, it is pretty humbling because there was another contest I was telling you about uh, in Vegas where there was, I think, under 200 entries. And I finished like top we five. We didn't get in that. We couldn't find a proxy. We didn't get in it. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk offline. We'll see if okay. we can figure it out. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I went like 58% in that one. I, I was able to make money. But if you go 58% in Circa, like forget about it. There's no shot. Um, yeah. But I'll give you a quick story uh, real quickly. So, um, Speaking of you know Notre Dame, I went to the Notre Dame Ohio State game. Um, you know this past September, it was my birthday. I spent way too much money on the tickets. Uh, went with my brother in law, sitting there, best seats I've ever had at a Notre Dame game, right behind the Ohio State bench. Uh, Ohio State f players are giving us the bird when they think yeah. they've lost the game, and then obviously Notre Dame can't close the door. You know they drop an interception. Ohio State gets into the end zone. Um, you know, uh, Ryan day starts yelling about Lou Holtz after the game. So that was pretty fun. And then the next day, Chris, we go to a bar. I meet up with my wife and two friends. We're in Chicago and I had two entries into circus survivor and both died on that day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had, I spent well over $500 on a, on a football ticket to watch my heart get ripped out of my chest. It's a bad I'm weekend. sitting there at a bar and I'm watching, I believe it was the Jaguars were like seven point favorites. This is before we knew Houston was any good. And, uh, they lost to Houston. And then later in the day, I took the Cowboys on the road at Arizona. They were 12 and a half point favorites and they lost that game as well. And what was just the, the cherry on the top was my wife just like giving me the evil eye being like, you just wasted this much money on this stupid. Uh, yeah, they don't get it. Survivor thing. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah, yep. So my yeah, story on that yeah. is two years ago. This is before I had had the relationship with Circa. Two years ago, I was in a 
Survivor with all my friends. Same rules. I did it. Won. I won. All the way through. All the way through. Wow. The problem is I'm not that smart. <laughs> so when I got into a circle last year, I was like, there's no chance. Like, I'm just donating money to the pot. Like, the ch- there, it's impossible to do that not only two years ago, but probably ever again. I just don't. I'm not that smart. So it's just, it's all over. I'll just keep playing the millions. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll probably end up, I don't know. I, as of right now, I'm saying I'm not doing Survivor. I'm just going to do millions. Um, but I know August is going to roll around. Oh, yeah. You're in. And I'm going to look at this. I have this chart, you know, like this. Look at you. I'm going to pull up this chart and I'll be like, oh, I could do it. I, I could do it. Just got to get to Thanksgiving, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're in. <laughs> I appreciate you, brother. Uh, download. Tim's podcast, the VSIN College Football Betting Podcast. Subscribe to it and support one of our buddies who, who's very good to us here at Iowa Everywhere. Thank you for your time, and we'll be watching you on VSIN. All right, bud. All right, Chris. Appreciate it, man.